I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to, to give this presentation. In fact, I shouldn't be the one doing it uh, because um, at my department I have given over the responsibility for the pediatric and neonatal uh, transport team to Christian who is sitting over there. So he should actually be the one telling you this. But um, I have been doing a little bit of transport in, in, in my life and uh, I have something to, to disclose to you. Um, I have uh, worked um, before um, here in Copenhagen as the head of the transport team. Then I moved to Stockholm and uh, part of my job there was also to be head of the transport team. Um, I currently also assist um, when uh, extremely preterm infants are born uh, abroad and need to be transported back home. So uh, this will definitely have some sort of impact on my presentation. And on top of that, I think that it's very cool to transport sick newborn infants. Um, some of my best friends actually do this. And my ch children also think it's rather cool. So um, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, please bear with me. Um, okay, we tried this yesterday and it actually worked out quite fine. So now I would like you to uh, be a little bit interactive and then go to this website and tap in the code and uh, give me a few words about what do you think is needed to conduct safe and easy neonatal transport. And while you do that, I will log on to the website. Did everybody get the codes? 509265. Five zero nine two six five. You definitely need a nurse. <laughs> now, this is a little bit uh, dangerous to do because, <clears throat> in fact, you're telling me what I'm going to tell you uh, for the next 40 minutes, and maybe I'm not going to tell you that at all. But I think it's quite nice to hear about your impression. What do we actually need to conduct neonatal transports in a safe and easy way? Um, nurse is still in the lead. And it seems that we also need to communicate with the nurses. That's very important. And bring the right equipment. I see a little doctor as well. Someplace. Uh, but as you can see, there's also different kinds of words that come into your mind. And that's actually uh, quite interesting because somebody also wrote that it should be nice. I will definitely come back to that. Team, clinical skills, protocols. In fact, you could do the presentation instead of me. So I can sit down there and you can all come up here and tell me what actually is needed. Okay, thank you for this input. Lovely. Um, now, this is a topic that uh, has not <clears throat> a lot of uh, research um, uh, background, actually. But uh, some people actually tried to, to do some research. And uh, they did it in a very interesting way. Uh, you may think that speed and power actually is a solution to everything, but as it turns out, it really isn't. It really isn't. A uh, wonderful program. If you haven't seen it, try to uh, look at the whole sequence. Uh, this was a specifically uh, developed patient delivery system. And uh, don't do that at home. OK, so what am I really going to talk about? Well, um, these are the topics that I will try to cover. And uh, I will leave some space at the end uh, for questions. First of all, come on, how hard can it really be? And then I will talk a little bit about risk reduction, logistics and organization. NICU on wheels, 
I will uh, turn my attention to specific medical emergencies during transport and also talk about uh, professionalism and roles. You have already uh, focused on some of those, so uh, you know what I'm going to talk about, I think. Then a specific uh, thing that I think is also needed to, to, to tell you about, namely patient and family-centered care during transport. I mean, why don't we all do that? We do it in our NICUs, but why not during transport? Uh, and specifically in this uh, respect, I would like to talk to you about how can we unlock the potential of parenting during transport. Then questions and some take-home messages. So that is actually the agenda. Now, this is the uh, so-called Ries Hospital, or the National University Hospital in Copenhagen, as it looks like today, uh, more or less. Actually, that building uh, over there uh, has been blown away and something new has come up. And in fact, we are in the process of building a new women's and children's hospital called Børneride that we hope will be ready in about five years. Um, there might be a slight delay, as always in those construction uh, things, um, but it will look like this, um, a symbol of two hands actually coming together. And uh, in this building, we will have the ability to treat all women and all children no matter what kind of diseases they have, basically. So we are really looking forward to that. So this is where I work on a daily business and the Department of Neonatology um, actually consists of basically three parts. Um, two teams and a transport team. Of course, it's the transport team that is in focus today. But uh, the first team is a team for the uh, mature children uh, that takes care of uh, different kinds of conditions, namely surgery, uh, heart and lung diseases, neurological conditions, PICU, and also ECMO um, for all children up to the age of two years. And then we have a premature team, team that uh, focuses on uh, prematurity and immaturity, and the transport team with its own baby lance. Uh, I will show you a couple of pictures of that. Uh, and this team also does transport on helicopter and sometimes on fixed wing fl uh, flights. Um, Denmark is a small country, but the Commonwealth of Denmark is actually a little bit bigger, at least now, um, because we sometimes have to go to the Greenland or the Faroe Islands to pick up children. So that means we cannot really compare ourselves to the Australian guys, but uh, it, it's okay, it's quite a distance. Now, talking about neonatal transport, I think one of the first things that you need to, to be aware of is Murphy's Law. Uh, anybody who doesn't know Murphy's Law? No? All of you knows it. Cool. Um, and this is really an, another, another way of saying um, be prepared for almost everything. Now, if, if you're a fatalist, you would say if there's more than one way to do a job, and one of those ways will end in disaster, then somebody will do it that way. If you are the pessimist guy, uh, you will say anything that can possibly go wrong does. And if you are more to the apocalyptic uh, sort of thing, then you would probably say uh, anything that can, could have, or will go wrong is going wrong all at once. <laughs> so what does a wise doctor, neonatologist or nurse say? Well, they would probably say, with diligent effort, he has established that there is no statistical basis for Murphy's Law. He has also established that he believes in it anyway. So this is really something that is very, very important to say. Be prepared for everything. Once you go out there, you are completely on your own and you have to uh, pack a total neonatal department into some sort of uh, compact um, thing and take it on wheels to another hospital and you have no support whatsoever apart from yourself, your skills and your equipment. This is uh, inspiration from my um, uh, former, from the former head of department, uh, Steen Hertel, um, who had this uh, wonderful idea about why are we really doing uh, transports. Well, this is an arbitrary um, um, picture showing the, as you, as you can see here on this axis, uh, time and then risk, low risk and high risk. Now, 
If a child is born at a level 1 or 2 NICU, then the risk will be at a certain height for this child. So it, it's really um, very symbolically. I hope you understand it. Uh, if this child's child needs a high intensive care treatment or need to be transferred upscale to another unit, then of course they will summon some sort of a transport team. Um, if the staff from this hospital were to transport the child themselves, then it would definitely mean that the risk for this child would increase significantly. But the hope is that once they get to the level 3 or 4 unit, the risk for this child will be even lower. So what we do in transport is actually this, that once we are called, we try to diminish the risk. And we try to diminish the risk uh, due to our uh, competences, our skills, our knowledge, the teamwork and the equipment. So this is actually what we try to bring to the regional hospital, namely everything that we normally do in our own NICU in order to stabilize and start treatment at the same level uh, at the regional hospital. And that would also mean that once we go on a transport from the regional hospital to our own unit, the, crease of, the, the risk will of course increase, but not to the same level as if somebody else should do it. And it also means, hopefully, that once we arrive to our own unit, we would have uh, stabilized the, the child and it would be at a lower risk uh, once we arrive. So basically, this is a very simple but I think very good way of showing why we need to do neonatal transports. Uh, time does matter. And uh, this is just one example of how you can uh, do the, uh, the logistics and the organization. Um, and this is what we strive for, namely to actually try to leave our own unit within 30 to maximum 45 minutes after the first call. I mean, you, you can do it in, in different ways, but uh, there are certain things that you have to go through. Uh, these calls always come uh, unsuspected. Um, and uh, from the initial contact to uh, when you leave your own hospital, you should be able to define why does this child actually need transportation, uh, what kind of medicine and equipment should you bring along, and you should also have some sort of transport vehicle, either be it an ambulance, helicopter, or fixed-wing flight. Fixed-wing flights will take a little bit longer. Um, but um, most of our transports are in, within the Copenhagen region, and that means that the transport time to the hospital is not very long. Still, it's the same principles. Uh, you have to be prepared for everything, and once you leave your own unit, you are on your own. There are also different ways of composing a transport team, and uh, in Copenhagen we do it like this. Uh, basically, the team consists of one doctor and one nurse. The doctor is a neonatologist, specialist in pediatrics and expert in neonatology, and the nurse is a very highly skilled and trained uh, neonatal intensive care nurse, both of them with year-long experiences in transports, and both of them also capable of doing what they need to do at the unit. Um, but sometimes when we are called for children up to the age of two years, uh, we uh, find ourselves a little bit uncomfortable about uh, stabilizing the airway and ask our colleagues at the uh, anesthesiological department for help. So we will be three people uh, all along instead of only two. Um, the phases that, that you go through uh, consist of preparation, on-site acti on -site activities, upscale uh, transport, uh, back transport to our own unit, and then the transport itself. So, uh, and the time spent, if you look at these statistics over the last couple of years at the local hospital, will be somewhere between 15 and 120 minutes. Sometimes it takes much, much longer, and sometimes even shorter, if everything is all set and you are ready to go, or if the child doesn't survive. So, how do you really do this? I mean, this is just an example of how a neonatal department may look like. Uh, this uh, equipment, though, is, is not really a part of our standard equipment on transport, as you recognize it. But it's, uh, I'm just trying to show, you, to, to show you that the equipment at a neonatal department actually takes up a lot of space. And uh, one of the things that you need to do is to compress everything into a compact, 
a convertible transport system that works as efficiently and as well as, the neonatal, uh, as at the neonatal department and then bring it along on wheels. And that takes uh, a lot of effort and time to do that. Uh, and we can't do it ourselves. So we need to do it in cooperation with the industrial partners all the time. And we all the time need to look at how can we even further develop and innovate things. So um, this is one example of uh, how a transport system can look like, the one that we have in, Com one of the ones that we have in, in Copenhagen. And this is what it looks like in Sweden. Um, what I'm trying to tell you with this picture is actually that even though the infant itself is very small, sometimes only four or five hundred grams, it does take up a lot of space. And in Sweden they have a complete bus for this. So that you bring along all the equipment, put it on the bus, and then you can work exactly as, more or less exactly, uh, as it is at the neonatal department. Fixed wing flight, yeah, cool. Mm. Uh, but it really isn't that cool. Um, and it is definitely not as romantic as, as it, look like, it looks like. Um, sometimes when everything is calm and you're on your way to the regional hospital, wherever it is, you can see the sun set or rise or whatever. You can have a drink. No, you can't. Uh, um, I once actually was on a, um, on a plane like that with a completely uh, filled uh, bar and everything, but um, the coffee was good. Um, no, so you need to do whatever you can to spend your time preparing for the job, resting, talking to your colleague, uh, establishing this very important teamwork. Um, because once you get there, uh, things may look quite differently. There's always a reason why we are called uh, to, to the hospital. Um, and it is not as romantic as it looks like. The loading and physical surroundings, um, this is a picture taken from uh, Sweden uh, in the midst of a winter period. So, and it's quite cold in Sweden sometimes. It, uh, that day it was about minus 15 or 20 degrees. Uh, so everything uh, is actually a, a, a challenge even as basic uh, a thing as keeping the infant warm. Um, and the system, this system weighs uh, on, on the, the wrong side of 200 kilos, so it, it, uh, and nothing should go wrong. You can't just put it up like this, you have to lift it um, horizontally and put it into the plane. Uh, so, and it really does take a teamwork. But, I would like to um, discuss a little bit about uh, medical emergencies and um, if you can once again turn on your cell phones and tap in your answer, uh, this time use the code 509256, wasn't that the one as last time? Uh, and then answer the question, which conditions may be life-threatening during air transport? Uh, let's see. Sorry, oh, we just, let's see whether the code is correct, one second. No, the code is 337397, so 337397. So, which conditions may be life-threatening during transport and specifically during air transport? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. And panic as well. That's a good one. Um, weather? Absolutely. Hypotension? This large tube, pressure loss, absolutely.
How many of you actually do neonatal transport? Can you uh, raise your hand? Wow, cool. Have you all volunteered for the workshop tomorrow? <laughs> Line failure, loss of airway, no teamwork. Clever one. Shock, is that shock to the team or shock uh, in the patient <laughs> or? It's, it's quite clear to me, based on, on your feedback, that first of all, you know what neonatology is. And most of you actually have been in a situation with the neonatal transports. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can read about, but uh, this really takes some experience to learn. Great. Uh, once you have finished answering, I can make these uh, slides available to you as well. That also includes the presentation if you want it. And here are some examples of uh, what may uh, may not go wrong during transport and specifically when we talk about air transport. So it shouldn't be uh, that uh, difficult for you to, to see what we are actually talking about here. Um, most of the things you already mentioned, um, what is basically the problem in, in all, of these, uh, all of these pictures? Can somebody tell me? Do they have something in common? Free air. Free air, yeah. Or air in, a pl in places where, where there shouldn't be any air. That's exactly correct, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. Uh, these are examples of things that you really need to be aware of, especially before you go on board an airplane, uh, because this can be devastating to, to the infant and uh, actually result in a deep shock in the uh, medical crew. Um, and this is due to the fact that, as you all know, the pressure actually uh, differs once you are here on the ground level and, and uh, at uh, cruise level. So uh, the normal cruising altitude, that depends of course on how long you're traveling, uh, but that would be around 30 to 36,000 feet if you're traveling long distance, and the outside pressure will only be one quarter of an atmosphere. Uh, if you are inside a pressurized cabin, the pressure will not be as ground level, uh, though it will still be about three-fourths uh, of an atmosphere, and that correlates to um, being um, at, at a height of 2 to 2.5 thousand feet, or a meter, sorry. Um, and um, it takes only 10 to 15 minutes from takeoff until you reach this cruising uh, altitude, and uh, then the problems will start. Um, on short flights, nationally, uh, the cruising altitude will probably be around 5 to 6 kilometers, but uh, the, uh, and, and the atmosphere pressure outside would be uh, half uh, an atmosphere. So, what happens is actually that air expands. So, at normal cruising altitude, if you view this an, as an example of an air bubble, uh, the trapped air will expand about 38% once you get to cruising altitude during these optimal conditions. And that will mean that you will suddenly have an air bubble like this. And of course, it depends on the size of the infant, the size of the patient, and where the, the air is, is actually located, but it can have uh, devastating consequences. There's something else that you need to, to uh, remember, namely the oxygen pressure and hypoxia. Uh, that also depends on uh, the altitude. And um, so um, the, the higher you go, the less oxygen you have. So that is something that you really need to keep in mind especially when, when you make calculations about how much oxygen to bring along. And oxygen is not, only, um, not the only thing because you, we all remember this hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. And uh, at sea level, your normal saturation will be in a normal person around 97 to 100%. But at normal cruising level, the normal saturation in all of us will be 92 to 94 percent. So we are really a little bit hypoxic when we go air traveling. And uh, most of you probably have felt it thousands of times. Um, 
Now, to a normal person, that is not a problem. But then again, if you have a complicated uh, medical condition, like, for example, some sort of cardiopulmonary disease, anemia, fever, and increased metabolism, it will be a huge problem. And most of our children actually have some sort of deficiencies in all of these, or some of them. But what else can go wrong? Remember the Murphy's Law? Well, there's a lot of things, and these are only examples of things that you need to be aware of. Namely, accelerations, vibration, noise, turbulence, humidity, fixation of patient, patient and family center care during transport. That can go wrong. Yes, it can go wrong, if you're not completely careful about that. I will come back to that a little bit later. Uh, and then you need to do a lot of things during the transport. You need to monitor the vital parameters. You need to be air, uh, aware of a, the ABSC, for example. Uh, for example, measuring the end tidal uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, sometimes measure acid, ba uh, acid base uh, balance if it's a long transport or if the child is very unstable. You need to be aware of the temperature control. Seizure activity, we have just heard about that. You can't really bring a full uh, EEG equipment on board yet, but uh, maybe it will come in the future. Uh, how about active hypothermia treatment? Yeah, it also takes up some space, energy, and you need to be aware of how it works and what can go wrong. Fluent balances and outputs. So these are just examples of what else you need to keep in mind. Then I would like to actually connect to some of the things that you mentioned in the beginning, namely the professionalism and the roles that uh, the transport team also have. Because apart from being professional in a clinical and medical sense, you need to be a specific person, in my opinion. Uh, so, and you can put it into specific uh, periods of the transport, namely, for example, during the preparation and planning period. Uh, and now I'm talking about what should the doctor and the nurse do together and individually. Well, they both need to be some sort of mentor, supervisor and coordinator. There's a lot of things that needs to be coordinated, a lot of people that needs to be talked to, uh, agreed with and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is also a very, very important skill if you need to do easy and safe transports. Once you go out on a transport, you need to be what I call a good soldier. Now, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that you can fall asleep almost anywhere. Uh, awaiting some sort of catastrophe. Uh, you also need to be a good colleague. You need to be human, a human being. You need to interact with your colleague. This is a great opportunity of getting to know each other. Um, also talk about everything else. Uh, but this is where you establish and continue to, uh, to keep a, a very good relationship and teamwork uh, within the medical crew. Then you arrive to the site and first of all you must realize that you are now an ambassador for the team from which you, uh, you came. So we are here not as um, specific persons, we are here as representatives for our hospital, departments, uh, and the healthcare system as well. Um, you need to put on a leadership role, uh, not necessarily immediately, but you need to get in all the information and then uh, get into the leadership role and be a professional. And by be being a professional, I also mean that talking uh, nicely to your colleagues because they have, did, they have done all they could in order to stabilize this infant but uh, due to a couple of uh, things they found out that this child needs a transport to a, uh, to a higher level. So they have done everything in their power to uh, do the best for this infant and you should not start to criticize them. On the transport back uh, hopefully the child is stable uh, so you can just observe how everything is going. In fact, an easy and safe transport is a very dull transport. Nothing happens and you can just sit there, watch the infant and drink your coffee. But you also need to be a provider of medical services at all time and be prepared of what might happen. 
And this is where Murphy's Law comes into play once again. You need to look into the future, and that's not so hard, is it? And then you arrive to your own site, and at that time point, you are still the team leader. You are the one knowing uh, most about the patient, how the transport went. Uh, you need to inform your colleagues about what has happened and what, the con uh, what condition the, the child is in. And then there's a lot of administrative things that you also need to do. Write the journal if you haven't done it on transport and uh, stuff like that. So really, this is a complex role that you put onto your shoulders. It's not only about putting tubes and catheters into a sick infant. And at all times, be aware of what might happen. And this I saw at a, uh, an airplane uh, company in Sweden. They had a, a big poster uh, at the front door saying, Assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. Sorry for the language, but you're in Denmark. Sometimes it takes more than uh, that to become a true professional. This is uh, one of my other colleagues, uh, Simon Troutner, who unfortunately is not here today. But uh, during a picket transport, uh, the child was very unhappy about not being able to sit with his mother. So uh, Simon decided to uh, imitate all the element sounds from the farm. <laughs> and I think the transport took about one and a half hours, something like that. <laughs> this is a picture taken by the nurse. She was thrilled. So, do whatever it takes to make the uh, transport as stable and uh, uncomplicated as possible. Now, for the last few minutes, I would like to turn my attention to the uh, patient and family center care during transport. Um, this is really important. Uh, we are not here to do our stuff. We are here to do what is best for the patient. And the patient comes from a family, and the family is really very, very important. So why not take the family on board your transports? How many of you do take parents on board your transports? Could you raise your hands? Yeah? Not as many as those who do transport, I notice. Um, it is possible. It's just uh, a decision that you need to take. I think this picture, uh, you can't see the faces of, of the parents here, but it, it shows in, in uh, every aspect, I think, the importance of the parents being present with their child. There's a lot of different opinions about when the parents should be uh, present or not. In my personal opinion, I think they should be present at all times. At least they should have the opportunity to be present at all times. And I mean at all times, even during CPR. It's much more uh, easy for them to understand what has happened and it really promotes a very good conversation with them afterwards and we have nothing to hide, really. So uh, this is just a piece of advice to all of you. Now, what is this picture to the right? Well, um, it's actually the first sketch or drawing of uh, the baby lands. Some of you have seen it before. Uh, but this was the um, first idea that we came up with. So it is not a rocket, but it was the first uh, concept of a, a baby, baby lands with an integrated patient and family-centered care on board. Now, we did some changes. We changed the incubator lift from the back to the side. We took the treatment room from the back to the middle due to a weight problem in the ba baby lands. Then we changed the lounge and recreation area. Notice the, uh, the wording of this. From the middle to the back section, we put in the uh, ICTV and electronic patient journal systems, and most importantly, a coffee machine. And this is how it looks like. Um, so I'm not saying that this is the perfect way of doing it. This, this is just a Copenhagen model, uh, at least for now. Um, but uh, I think that my Danish colleagues here can tell that, that it's really a, a pleasure to, to go in, in, in this baby lands. You can still hear the sirens, but it's, it's very cool to go there. It's by far the biggest uh, uh, ambulance in Copenhagen, and it sounds also a little bit specifically, so you can hear it from a long distance. Um, and from the inside, uh, this is the first picture from the lounge area, where the, you can see there are, there are four the chairs here, and uh, the parents can sit here and look through a window. They can even go through a door to the uh, treatment compartment here. 
And if everything is calm and easy, then uh, one of the parents can change places with either the doctor or the nurse uh, and be uh, with their child during the transport. So they know everything. And if they can't see actually what is going on, there's a camera installed on top of, in the roof here, pointing directly onto the um, uh, incubator. So uh, this is probably the best job in the world. Um, um, I just wanted to show a, a couple of happy faces. Um, right, okay, now it's time for a little bit of interactivity once again. And this time I hope that the code is correct. Go once again to the website and tap in the code 616726 and just give me a short feedback on what words come to mind after hearing this keynote. So 616726. Cool. <laughs> Where can I apply? Uh, please call me. <laughs> Prepare for fuck up. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it must be a dame. <laughs> and uh, one thing that I haven't really touched upon is the financial part of it, because it really is expensive. Of course it is. Uh, but as long as it matters and makes a difference, I think that is all worth the money. Um, great. Thank you so much. I promise you I'll give you a, um, a copy of all of these once they have finished and you're putting all your uh, feedback. Um, and then it's time for questions. I'm very open to hear from you whether you have anything to ask or add or something like that. Thank you very much for your attention.